Do you think if humans colonize Mars, the dynamic between the civilization on Earth and Mars will be fundamentally different than the dynamic between individual nations on Earth right now? Like that, that's the thing to load into the simulate the agent based simulation yeah. we're talking about. If we settle it, Mars will very quickly want to become its own nation. Well, no, there's already going to be nations on Mars. That's guaranteed. Yeah, the moment be you have own. two million people, one the moment you have one million people, there's going to be two tribes, right? And right. then they're going to start fighting, right? And the question is interplanetary fighting. How quickly does that happen, and does it have a different nature to it because uh, of the distances? You know. Are you a fan of The Expanse? Do you have you watched The Expanse? Great show. Because it's all about the, I highly recommend to everybody. It's based on a series of books that are excellent. It's on Prime, six seasons. And it's basically about the settled solar system. It takes place about 300 years from now. And the entire solar system is settled. And it is the best show about interplanetary politics. The first season, actually, um, the journal, what was it? Uh, Foreign, Foreign Affairs said the best show on TV about politics it takes place is interplanetary. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, human beings being human beings, yes, well, there will be warfare and there will be conflict. Um, and I don't think it'll be necessarily all that different, you know, because really I think within a few hundred years, we will have lots of people in the solar system. And it doesn't even have to be on Mars. We did a paper where we uh, look based on, because I was wanted to know about whether an idea in the expanse was really possible. In the expanse, the, the asteroid belt, what they've done is they have colonized the asteroid belt by hollowing out the asteroids and spinning them up and living on, on the inside, right? Because mm -hmm. they have the Coriolis force. And I thought like, wow, what a cool idea. And when I ran the uh, blog for NPR, I actually talked to the guys and said, did you guys calculate this, see whether it's possible? Sadly, it's not possible. The rock is just not strong enough that if you tried to spin it up to the speeds you need to get uh, one third gravity, which is what I think the minimum you need for human beings, uh, the rock would just fall apart. It would break. But we came up with another idea, which was that if you could take small asteroids, put a giant bag around them, a nanofiber bag, and spin those up, it would inflate the bag. And then even a small couple of co uh, kilometer wide asteroid would expand out to. Um, you could get like a, a, a Manhattan's worth of material inside. So forget about even colonizing Mars, space stations, right? Or space habitats with millions of people in them. So anyway, the point is that I think, uh, you know, within a few hundred years, it is not unimaginable that there will be millions, if not billions of people living in the solar system. And you think most of them will be in space habitats versus on Mars and on the planetary surface? I th you know, it's a lot easier on some on some level, right? It depends on how, what, like with nanofabrication and such. But, you know, getting down a gravity well is hard, right? Um, so, you know, there's a certain way in which there's a lot of, you know, it's a lot easier to build real estate out of the asteroids. Um, but we'll probably do both. I mean, I think what will happen is, oh, you know, the next, should we make it through climate change and nuclear war and all the other, and AI, um, the the next thousand years of human history is the solar system, right? And so, you know, I think we'll settle every nook and cranny we possibly can. And it's, you know, it's a beautiful, what I love about what's hopeful about it is this idea you're going to have all of these pockets and, you know, I'm sure there's going to be a Mormon space habitat, <laughs> like, you know, there's going to be whatever you want, a libertarian space habitat. Everybody's going to be able to kind of create their, there'll be lots of experiments in human flourishing. Mm -hmm. And those kinds of experiments will be really useful for us to sort of figure out better Better ways for us to interact and have maximum flourishing, maximum wellness, maximum democracy, maximum freedom. Uh, do you think that's a good backup solution to go out into space, sort of to avoid the possibility of humans destroying themselves completely here on Earth? Well, I think, you know, I want to be always careful with that because, it, you know, like I said, it's centuries that we're talking about, yes. right? Um, so, you know, the, the problem with climate change, you know, and same thing with nuclear war, it's breathing down our necks now. So it's not a, you know, trying to establish a, a, a base on Mars is going to be so hard that it is not even going to be close to being self-sufficient for a couple of, you know, a century at least. So it's not like a backup plan now. Um, you know, we have to solve the problem of climate change. We have to deal with that. There's still enough nuclear weapons to really do our, you know, horrific things to the planet for human beings. Um, so I don't think it's like a backup plan in that way, but I do think, like I said, it's the prize. It's, you know, if we get through this, then we get the entire solar system to sort of play around in and, and experiment with and do really cool things with. Well, I think it could be a lot less than a couple of centuries if there's a urgency, like a real urgency, like a catastrophe, like a 
maybe a small nuclear war breaks out where it's like, holy shit, this is for sure, for sure a bigger one is looming. Yeah. Maybe, maybe if geopolitically the war between China and the United States escalates, where there's this tension that builds and builds and builds and it becomes more obvious that we need to really, really, really escalate. Yeah. I think my, my only dilemma with that is that I just think that a, a self-sufficient base is a, so far away right. that like say you start doing that and then there is a full-scale nuclear exchange. That base is, you know, it's not going to last because it's just, you know, the, the self-sufficiency requires a kind of an economy, like literally a material economy that we are so far from with Mars, that we are centuries from. Like I said, you know, three centuries, which is not that long, two to three centuries. You know, look at 1820, nobody had traveled faster than 60 miles an hour unless they were falling off a cliff, right? And now we routinely travel at 500 miles an hour, but it is sort of centuries long. So that's why I think, I think we'd be better off trying to solve these problems than, you know, I just think the odds that we're going to be able to create a self-sufficient uh, colony on Mars before that threat comes to head is small. So we'd have to deal with the threat. Yeah, it's an interesting scientific and engineering question of how to create a self-sufficient colony on Mars or out in space as a space habitat, like where Earth entirely could be destroyed, you could still survive. Yeah, yeah. Because it's really what about, you know, thinking about complex systems, right? Um, a space habitat, you know, would have to be as robust as an ecosystem, as the kind of thing, you know, you go out and you see a pond with all the different webs of interactions. You know, that's why I, I always think that, uh, you know, if this process of going out into space is actually, will help us with climate change and with thinking about making a long-term sustainable version of human civilization. Because you really have to think about these webs, the, the, the complexity of these webs and recognize the biosphere has been doing this forever. The biosphere knows how to do this, right? And so A, how do we support, how do we build a vibrant, powerful technosphere that also doesn't, you know, mess with the biospheres, mess with the biospheres capacity to support our technosphere. So, you know, by doing this, by trying to build space habitats, in some sense, you're thinking about building a small scale version of this. So I think, I think the two problems are going to kind of feed back on each other. Well, there's also the other possibility of, uh, like the movie, uh, Darren Aronofsky's, uh, postcard from earth, where we can create this kind of life gun that just shoots. So as opposed to, uh, engineering everything. Yeah basically seeding life on a bunch of places and letting life do its thing, which is really good at doing, it seems like. So as opposed to like the, with a space habitat, you basically have to build the entire biosphere and technosphere, the, right. whole, the whole thing the whole by thing. yourself. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you just, hey, the aforementioned cockroach with some bacteria, <laughs> place it in Europa, uh, I think you'd be surprised what happens. Yeah, right? yeah. Like honestly, if you put, a huge amount of bacteria, like a giant number of organisms from Earth into the, uh, on Mars, on uh, some of these moons of the other planets in the solar system. Do you think, like, I, I feel like some of them would actually find a way to survive. I, you know, the moon is hard because the moon is just like, there's no, you know, the moon may be really hard. But, you know, that'd be, I mean, I wonder, somebody must have done these experiments, right? Like how, because we know they're extremophiles, right? We know that they're, you can go down, you know, 10 miles below the earth's surface and there are things where there's no sunlight there's you know the conditions are so extreme and there's lots of microbes having a great time yeah. living off the radioactivity you know in the rocks but you know they had lots of time to evolve to those conditions so i'm not sure if you dumped a bunch of bacteria you know so somebody like somebody must have done these experiments like you know how fast could microbial evolution occur in under harsh conditions that you maybe get somebody who figures out, okay, I can deal with this. I think the moon's too much because it's so sterile, but you know, Mars, I don't know, maybe, I don't know. We'd have to, that, but it's an interesting idea. I wonder if somebody has done those experiments. Yeah. You think somebody would like, let's take a bunch of microbes. The harsh, the take the harshest possible condition of all different kinds, temperature, right. all this kind of stuff. Right. Pressure, so salinity, and then just like dump a bunch of things that are not used to it. And then just see, does everybody just die? You know, that's it. There's, you know. The thing about life, it, it uh, flourishes in a non-sterile environment where there's a bunch of options for resources, even if the condition is super harsh. In the lab, I don't know if you can reconstruct harsh conditions plus options for survival. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, a, yeah. like you have to have the, 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 uh, the huge variety 
of resources that are always available on a planet somehow, yeah. even when it's in super harsh conditions. So that, so that's actually not a trivial experiment. And I wouldn't even, if somebody did that experiment in the lab, I'd be a little bit skeptical. Cause like if, cause I could see bacteria doesn't survive in this kinds of temperature, but then I'd be like, ah, I don't know. I don't know. You is play, there you, enough, right? Is it, you, you know, is there, are there other options? Like, you know, is the, is the condition rich enough? Rich enough, yeah. You know, there's a, there's an alternative view though, which is there's this great book um, uh, by Kim Stanley Robinson called Aurora. You know, so there's been a million um, century ship stories, like where, you know, Earth sends out a, you know, generation ship or century ship and it goes to another planet and they land and they colonize. And on this one, they get all the way there and they think it's, the planet's going to be habitable. And it turns out that it's not habitable for Earth life. Like that, you know, there's, there's like, you know, bacteria or prions actually, you know, super, that just like, you know, kill people in the simplest way. Um, and the, his, the important thing about this book was the idea that like, you know, life is actually very tied to its planet. Mm -hmm. It may not be so easy. I just thought it was a really interesting idea. I'm not necessarily supporting it, but that actually life reflects the planetary conditions that not the planetary, the planet itself, the whole lineage, the whole history of the biosphere. And it may not be so easy this to, to just sort of be like, oh, just drop it over here and it'll, you know, because the bacteria, even though they're individual examples of life, and I kind of believe this, the true unit of life, it's not DNA, it's not a cell, it's the biosphere. It's the whole, the whole community. Thing. Yeah. That's actually an interesting field of study is how when you arrive from one planet to another, so we humans arrive to a planet that has a biosphere, maybe a technosphere, what is the uh, way to um, integrate yeah. without killing yourself or, or the, the other one? Or, or the other yeah. one. That's, let's just stick to biology. Like that, that's an interesting question. I don't know if we uh, have a rigorous way of investigating that. Because everybody, everything on life is, you know, has the same lineage. We all come yeah. from Luca, you know, the last universal common ancestor. And what you see is often in science fiction, people will do things like, oh, well, it's okay. Because like that bio, uh, that metabolism, that biochemistry is so different from ours that we can coexist because they don't even know each other, you know, right. right? That the, you know, and then the other version is you get there, you land and instantly, you know, the nose bleeds and you're dead. Right? So it's, uh, Unfortunately, I think it's the latter. Yeah, is, it sort of feels is, like, is, is feels the like more a very like alien it. kind of thing.